You're listening to Changing Reality. Changing Reality, where we bend reality all across the world. Only on WQHS Radio. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Changing Reality. Thank you all so much for tuning in on this lovely evening. So, Changing Reality, for all of you who may be new to the show or if it's your first time tuning in, is a show that features phenomenal people from all walks of life who are changing their own reality. Hosted right here on WQHS Radio, Penn student-run online radio, uh, we'll be hanging out and interviewing social change makers, entrepreneurs, business owners, to even artists, musicians, and inspiring individuals and top executives from all across the world. And many who've actually spent some time here on the Penn campus. So we are going to hear these inspiring stories on how they are changing their reality, while at the same time figuring out a little bit more about ourselves, about the things that we can do to learn what makes us special, to learn about what the world out there has to uh, has to await us. So I wanted to do this show simply because I felt like there are a lot of stories that enable us to do this, that inspire us, that give us insight to how the world works, and that uncovers uh, more about ourselves as we listen to other people's experiences too. And these people make waves in lives of the most around them, but their stories may not always be told. So through this show, I hope that we can learn more about these individuals who are changing the world in their own capacity. And personally, I founded and run a youth movement called Ascendance in Malaysia, which is where I'm from, that collaborates with the Malaysian Ministry of Education to help provide an alternative education platform for any student who wants to change their reality, be it in elementary school or all the way up in college. And we work with these students through various sessions, programs, experiential learning activities and projects to help them discover what they're passionate about, learn about themselves and the world around them, and start their own careers while they're still in school that creates meaningful impact not just for themselves but for those around them as well so listening to these inspiring stories has always been a huge part of my career of my startup and it's through people who've been willing to share that we've actually managed to impact over 15,000 students in 900 communities um, spanning over seven different countries in and having incubated countless number of student-run projects and social enterprises run fully by kids aged 8 to 25 years old so in a way, these stories actually do create meaningful impact in changing reality. And we're even having an international conference with Ascendance uh, for 50,000 students in September 2021, which includes young Gen Z speakers from eight different countries. And um, again, will be fully organized, conducted, um, and even delivered by students age 8 to 25. So if you've got any questions about that, do drop it in the chat below. But for today's show, we have something very special in store. I know that from my time in Penn here, a lot of us have been interested in things like the fintech industry, but often we don't really see all perspectives of it. So how better to learn about it than to find out more about the experiences of someone who's probably been at every aspect of the industry? Today's speaker is a prominent figure in the fintech market who has a record of success and expertise in driving product innovation, building partnerships, and surpassing business objectives. Having been a director at City, the head of bank partnerships at Union Pay International in the Americas, a director of strategic partnership at some of the biggest names in the fintech industry like PayPal, to even a VP of strategic partnerships at um, startups in this space, such as Spring Market. He brings all-rounded expertise into the world of finance and is willing to share that with all of us here today. So today he manages some of the biggest clients at the fast growing financial service and software uh, as a service company, Stripe, personally one of my um, one of the companies I looked up I look up to. So without further ado, let's bring our amazing guest speaker onto our virtual stage so that we can pick his brain for some of his experiences. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm very well. Uh, thanks uh, very much for uh, inviting me on to the show. This is uh, quite a treat. Well, thank you so much. Now, before we start, I just, I've just i got to clear something out. You two were um, on WQHS radio during your time at Penn, right? Indeed. Indeed. I was a DJ. Uh, I think they still refer to them as DJs. But yes, I had a, a weekly show. And uh, it was uh, primarily al alternative rock that I would play. 
and uh, it was great. Um, loved every minute of it, and it's wonderful to be back now as an alum, not only uh, for for Penn for the Penn community, but as a WQHS alum. All right, so I'll try my best to be a great DJ for today. The bar is up there, guys. But <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm like, this is the most pressure I've been in for a while. <laughs> I was enjoying my summer. But anyway, thank you so much for joining us. And as the introduction sits, I think there's nothing left for me to share. But you've been amazingly successful in this whole uh, fintech industry. But where did it all start? Was this some grand plan that you knew since your DJing days and were planning forward? Or were you just like the rest of us DJs to just come on and like play music and a little lost about our lives? Yeah, I would, I would say probably the latter, for sure. Um, you know, when I was uh, at Penn many, many years ago, um, you know, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go with my career. Um, I thought about doing a lot of different things and, you know, sort of thinking back to the days on campus as a psychology major, um, yeah, I really enjoyed sort of the study of human behavior and what, how people act and interact. And so I always knew that I'd want to be involved in jobs that would give me an opportunity to interact with people, manage relationships, solve business problems, and, and so forth. Um, and I wasn't really sure what industry. Um, when I came out of school, I, do, I did what a lot of people do, which is take a job that keeps options open. So I joined a, a strategy consulting firm um, I actually happened to work on some projects that were financial services related, technology, innovation, sort of industries that were always evolving. Um, I worked on a project um, for a bank at the time that was thinking about jo uh, joining a pilot um, where you would put like cash or digital cash onto like what's called a smart card. and. At the time, cash was king. It was like 80, 90% of transactions. Now it's flipped. <laughs> so almost no one uses cash now. At the time, almost everybody used cash. And, you know, businesses and commerce are all about how people get paid and pay for things. That's like, that is the basis of business. So here I am many years later and having the opportunity to help people pay for things and get paid and work in this industry that's super dynamic, constantly changing. That's really what's kept me in the space. So, um, you know, I've been very fortunate to work with a lot of interesting people and different companies and, and uh, it was completely sort of by happenstance how I got into it um after business school um and i sort of stuck with it um so but i guess you picked the right field to pioneer i mean like who would have thought that like online payments would be so big so congrats on the foresight if you've got any lottery numbers in mind let me know and i'll go and uh put that <laughs> I mean, you seem to, you seem to have it figured out. Even if, like, you, putting myself in the perspective, if, if cash were really was king back then, I guess you made the right bet in the correct industry. So, again, if you've got any ideas, I'm all yeah. yours. And I, um, I, uh, you go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think, I think, you know, a lot of where you go in your career is is may it may be sort of thoughtful, but a lot of it's luck. <laughs> and um, it is, it's, you know, right place, right time. And you just have to continue to sort of think about like what inspires you and what makes you interested to, to go to work every day or anything you do, whether it's, you know, what you do in your personal life or business life. It's all about just finding things that you like to do and that you're good at. If you can find that intersection, then you're sort of golden. Um, but uh yeah, I'll, I'll keep, if you, if you do find some more lottery tickets and, you know, you can never play enough about that. I'm still waiting for my lottery ticket to come in, so. 
All right, all right, got it. And you speak about finding that one thing that you're good at and also the thing that you're passionate about. So is this something like, like tell me the secrets of life here. Like, is this something you know instantly? Like you work on a project, did this happen to you? You worked on like a FinTech project and you're like, this is it for me? Or did it take some time for you to actually realize that you were passionate about it? So, I mean, for me, you know, and, and I think you'll be asked this like in interviews and like when people ask you sort of like what you want to do in your career, a lot of it, a lot of people will say like, what's your superpower? <laughs> and Like everybody's a superhero, which they sort of are, right? Like, you know, everyone's very unique and different. And I, I've always, you know, dating back to my days at, in college, right? It was, it was about understanding how people tick. And I think that my EQ, which stands for emotional quotient for those more used to hearing IQ, which is a completely different measure, which I won't take any credit for in terms of where I score there, but EQ, I think, like, I, I think I've got a pretty decent understanding of myself, most importantly, and being self-aware of what, how I, how I work and how I interact with people. And I, and I think I have a pretty decent understanding of others. And so when you meet people, whether they're family members, friends, coworkers, potential uh, business partners, it's always important for you to understand where they're coming from and what's important to them and what motivates them and what's going to help them um, be better in life and in their jobs. And so I've always hung my hat, my superpower really around relationships and managing those relationships. And so it could have been in financial services which it ended up being in fintech. When I, when I first started my career in consulting, I was consulting on different industries, healthcare, financial services, consumer products. And before financial services, like I was actually in the basketball uh, world for a little bit. I was working for the National Basketball Association. So you're a senior you know, manager of NBA, which is amazing. So, you know, so that was pretty cool. And, you know, I went from working at the NBA to get my MBA. So, um, but I think, you know, not only the passion thing where you want to figure out like what you're good at and what you like to do and finding that intersection. The other thing is, you know, if, if you're, if you know what your superpower is, you can sort of apply it to lots of different industries and lots of different types of jobs um, because it's generally applicable. Um, you can take that, 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 that superpower and you can put it into your functional role, um, whether it be marketing, whether it be, you know, finance, whether it be, you know, being a doctor, you know, whatever it may be. And then you can, you can sort of shift around into different industries, if that makes sense. So. Yeah, I, I think that that's a really good point because I feel like we often hear this advice which you've got to find the thing that you're passionate about and for many of us or at least for me at the very least um, it was never something that was clear cut like this industry this time do this and all of that but that doesn't mean that like there's not things that I'm good at or things that I like doing uh, but it might not be in a specific industry or a specific place and I think this actually like leads into something that we were talking about um, prior to this little interview and you actually sharing the difference between being a functional person and an industry expert maybe you could elaborate a little on that as well yeah sure so like the when I, I try to get a lot, I, as much advice as I, as I'm glad to give to people, I like to get as much from others. So <laughs> I like to ask a lot of questions. Normally I'm the one asking the questions tonight. I'm attempting to answer the questions, not my comfortable space, but I'll do it because you know, the, anything I can do to give back to the tank community. Um, and harsh is pretty awesome. So, um, with respect to sort of function versus role, you can 
somebody gave me the advice that if you want to change your job in your career, you should probably not attempt to change both function and and industry at, simultaneously. So let's say like you're a marketer, you know, in the consumer products industry, so, you know, trying to figure out how to sell more toilet paper and then going to be like an investment banker covering healthcare. Like Literally. that would be, that's a little bit of a jump. So, or going from, you know, a doctor, you know, curing cancer to, I don't know, like being the owner or managing like a baseball team or something like it, it it's, you know, ideally you sort of like, if you're, if you understand like what your functional expertise is, and then you can sort of apply it again against different industries or different areas, or you could be like really know a lot about financial services and you could be in compliance or risk management or in marketing or in uh, financial crimes, uh, sanctions, or being an engineer um, and you sort of, you apply your understanding of the, of the, of the industry and you just kind of pop around and bop around into different roles. Okay, cool. And you mentioned earlier, you did like many different projects. You were like many of us who may not have known exactly what you wanted, but you were in a position where you could try out different projects and uh, you even had an op the opportunity to work at uh, the NBA for a while, which is very excited before you progressed and uh, went back to do your MBA. A little bit of a tongue twister, but nice <laughs> career for you. Um, and rhymes too, so you must have definitely thought that through. And uh, <laughs> after that, you actually started at City, right? And um, you were a management associate in their leadership development program. Yes. Did you go to City for a reason? Like, did you like think, what should I do? And then looked at your wallet and say, hmm, car, this looks like it. Or was there some like broader perspective to it that, yeah? Yeah, so as, as much as Harshly, you know, you, you sort of make it sound like I, I was very thoughtful about my career. Like, again, sort of things happened in different ways, um, not all planned. So when I came out of business school, I thought I was going to apply my career uh, experience and interest and passion for basketball and entertainment. And I was going to combine it with my consulting experience and I was going to be a media and entertainment consultant. Right, so sort of take those two jobs and smash them together, and then and I had a I had a job lined up, and I was actually in uh, Vietnam uh, traveling after business school, and I got a phone call from my wife, and she said, "I've got good news and bad news. The good news is you still have a job with this company, this consulting firm. The bad." That's the good news. The bad news is it doesn't start for 12 months because they had to defer all the start dates because like business wasn't booming, you know, sort of this is one of the dot com boom and bust bus moments, you know, um, not to date myself. But yes, <laughs> um, there was a time where the Internet bubble burst back way back when. So I ended up contacting city which was one of the companies that i had interviewed with on campus um out of my mba and they were fortunate they were they were nice enough to give me you know a shot again and so that kind of led me down a different path um i had always been interested like i mentioned back to my days um after penn of interested in technology and innovation and this sort of role was going to give me a chance to try out some more things because it was rotation rotation based and i and i i, I firmly believe that any opportunity that you have to try things out whether it's hey you go to a restaurant and you <laughs> haven't tried something on the menu try it like what's the worst thing that happens you sort of, you know, don't like it and you move on. Um, I always love to try different foods, travel different places. It, that's sort of the spice of life. 
So the more opportunities you have to test things out, then you sort of by process of elimination, you can sort of figure out what you like and don't like, and you can course correct. Okay, very cool. And I think after two or three years in that rotational program, you actually became the assistant VP of acquisitions marketing to uh, for the U.S. credit cards division of City. Was that again something that you you saw you had a talent for, or was it something that you applied your skills and you focused and you kind of got that position? Yeah. So what happened was you tried. You, so you got placed into some different roles. Um, it was a little bit of a marriage thing where you would look around at the opportunities and and the needs of the of the different departments and. Uh, and so I had done a couple of different roles in some different parts of the, the business. So city um, group, um, some people refer to it as city group, some people call it Citibank, but you know, city has a, uh, a, uh, a consumer banking business where they sell lots of products and services to consumers globally, right? Credit cards, banking accounts, mortgages, all sorts of financial services products, and um, even digital payments, um, which was actually my first rotation. Um, this was back when you could email money to each other. So like you would send somebody an email and say, hey, I've just sent you $20, and then they would click on it in their email, and then they would um, need to open up an account and then you could sort of, it, it would digitally transfer. So these were like the early days of PayPal and Venmo and Cash App. And here we are many years later. And now people just can fly around on their phones and send money in, in, a, in a matter of milliseconds. But um, I, I always thought that it would be beneficial again for me to try out some different um different roles. And so I ended up going into the credit card business at City, and, and I liked applying sort of a lot of the toolkit that I'd gotten from my consulting job, which was problem solving, analytics, and helping grow businesses. And so I, I got to work on what at the time was called alternate channel marketing. Um, and there was different ways to find people to sign up for credit cards instead of just getting like an envelope in the mail. So you could do you could do advertising in the newspaper. You could run radio spots. You could, you know, buy advertising on the internet. Like so, there was lots of different ways. So I got to do that. That's really what acquisition marketing means. But it's it's basically growth. People would call it now growth marketing. Um, and then I got to work as well on existing customer management. So helping people to retain their relationship. So it's either getting customers or keeping customers. That's really what business is about. Um, it's one of those two things um, so in many you ways. you covered all the bases in a sense by just like most of well, them. Well, you like, so, and then while I was at City, I also got to build products and uh, help launch those products um, and and then try to uh, you know, grow them. So I, I, I was very fortunate that I was able to touch a lot of different pieces of the business. I even got to do work in regulatory relations, which some people may find scary or, or not interesting, but to me, I was learning and life is about learning. Um, again, figuring out um, what you are passionate about and just trying to continue to get your, your brain to, to think in different ways. So um, as, much as, as much as some people may say, you shouldn't really stay at, a, at the, the same company for a long time, um, the younger folk these days, you know, they, they change jobs a lot more than let's say when I came out of school, but as long as you're continuing to be challenged and you're continuing to learn, um, 
I think I think there's there's no reason why you shouldn't um, stay put at one at one company or one career. And and you did so many things with Citibank, and you went all the way to becoming a director or, or sorry a senior uh, VP in Citibank as well. So what do you think was was about you? The thing about you that enabled you to grow and enabled you to actually take up all of these challenges? Because not everyone's like that. Not everyone can move up so fast in a sense. So what what, what what's the secret in a way? Yeah. What, well, I I did. I don't think I moved that fast because I was there for a while. Um, I think it was. Um, I think that it's important to understand what the expectations are of your management team, your boss, your manager, or your peers, or whoever is evaluating you based on your performance. And you're being evaluated not only by your manager, let's say, or by peers, because sometimes you get peer reviewed. Um, so that's valuable input. Um, you're also being evaluated um, on, a, on essentially a curve or a scaled basis, like when you take tests in school against others. So, because um, not everybody, you, you're, you're sort of, you're being evaluated against your 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 peer group, um, so I think it's it really comes down to understanding what the expectations are of the job, making sure you have clear uh, clear goals that you've agreed upon with your with your manager, and that you really focus on not only achieving those goals, but going even further for extra credit um, to sort of use a school analogy. And so it's, it's more cut and dry as much as possible to, to be able to display and show what you've, what you've done to deserve, you know, more responsibility and a bigger role or a different role. And, and have that sort of record of success. So documentation, clear roles and responsibilities, and and also a lot of luck, right? Right place, right time. It all, look, you can't get, I, I, I know Harshi, you think I'm, I, I'm focused on luck and lottery tickets and all this stuff, but a lot of, a lot of career advancement and career opportunities a lot of it just comes down to certainly your your own capabilities, but also, you know, good fortune. Um, you always want good fortune on your side. So, and I was also very fortunate to work with some pretty amazing leaders, managers who I learned a lot from. Okay. Very nice, very nicely said. And I think that it's a better answer to answer with luck than if you gave me some BYDX formula that I'd have to figure out and go home and think about for three weeks. So I'll just do my best at wherever I am. And even after your time... Show up. Saying, <laughs> show up every day, Harsha. Just show okay. up. All right. And so be, there's, no, be, and, there's no... And be present. <laughs> be present. Okay. So there's no science behind it. Just show up, be present, do those things. All right. I, I think that's really good advice, especially for college students to try to figure out the theory of everything in a sense before we begin. And don't, over, again, don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Makes me feel a little bit better or worse. I'm not sure. But again, I'll digest this later and come back to you with any <laughs> questions. Which reminds me, for our audience, if you guys have any questions, do drop them in the chat. I think they're a little stunned with some of the amazing insights you're sharing. So forgive them. And um, on that note, even after you were at City, you, your, the next thing you did was actually you were, uh, I think, at uh, Union Pay International on the Americas region. You were head of bank partnerships there. So what's happening here? You were at one side on the bank side, and then now you're um, kind of with the uh, online payment side where you work with banks. So how did you make that transition? And um, how did those experiences, having been on the other side, help you in a way? Yeah, so 
Um, I, I had the opportunity to work for this uh, card network. A lot of people are familiar with Visa, MasterCard, American Express. Um, one of the other uh, card networks, global card networks, uh, is called China Union Pay, which is based in China. Um, and they have actually more cards issued by the banks um, that they partner with than any other card brand out there. Billions of cards, debit cards, credit cards, prepaid cards. And so they were looking to expand and go into more markets and have more bank partners working with them that would issue a debit credit card with the China Union Pay brand on the card. And, and then when somebody would use it in a store online, right, it would run over their rails and they would essentially be the processor of that help connect the merchant on one side and the, and the, uh, the consumer bank on the other. So um, what, what, what you'll see, right, is we may talk about some other of my career turns, but companies generally feel more comfortable. And if, if what you're doing is something that you've done previously, or you can help them, you, you, you understand what it means to be in other people's shoes, right? And so when I had this opportunity to work for Union Pay, I would essentially be talking to people like at Citibank and saying, hi, Citibankers, would you be interested in working with my company um, and doing some sort of a partnership? So I'm leveraging my superpower or, you know, like this relationship management capability. And then I'm leveraging some of my industry knowledge and also how to work with a banking team, with a bank entity, the complexity, the matrix, uh, spider web sort of organizational structure. And you can always just sort of move to the other side of the table. Um, and you can empathize and understand what's important to them. And uh, that's really, how it all came to be, and and uh, and uh, it was it was it was a great experience. I got to visit, you know, countries that I never even had heard of, um, amongst other things. So that was pretty fun. Okay, very cool. And I like that whole point of being able to put yourself in someone in like the other person's shoes, in a sense. So like just off the record was there anything that surprised you now that you were working with banks that you're like oh i used to do that i should not have done that in a sense or anything that you realized with um you look you saw differently from the other side of the table you know i, I i'd say that well everything's on the record right because we're recording so <laughs> sorry <laughs> um i would i would say that i had when you step outside right? And then you're working with an organization, you can't help but compare them. And so, you know, banks have been around for many, many years, a lot of them have, and they've grown in terms of size, not only their assets, and their businesses, but the actual employee bases are quite big. In many cases, and when there's lots of people working at a company, it can take more time to make decisions and get things done. And so I think that um, while, while I, I always sort of understood why things were happening as slow as they were in certain cases, um, you know, I think that any company should try to figure out however big it is that getting decisions uh, figured out quicker than slower is really important to, to uh, business outcomes, positive business outcomes. Okay. 
Very cool. And speaking about big companies, I think after your time um, uh, with the uh, uh, Union Pay International, you went to one of the biggest, I would say, um, players in the whole uh, fintech space that I know of at the very least, which is PayPal. And you were actually a director of strategic partnerships there. So again, this is a little bit of a different angle in the same space or in the same industry in a way. So how was it different now being on PayPal side? Yeah, so um, just to sort of like talk a little bit about digital payments and how it all works, we'll just do like a quick payments 101. So <laughs> when you buy something online or in person, right, you're, you're using some sort of, let's say, uh, wallet or you're using like a credit card and you're, you're checking out either, you know, in person or online. And so the card, uh, the, your, your payment uh, product is being processed on behalf of that merchant by some entity. Uh, it could be like a PayPal um, or it could be another payment processor. And then that transaction gets sent over, let's say a card network, like a MasterCard or a Visa, or it could be a local um payment rail a local uh local network and then that gets sent to the the card issuer that issued your card and they either approve it or they decline it and then it comes back the message comes back over the card network and then back to the merchant processor and then all of that happens in milliseconds and then you see if you you can walk out of the store or you can say thank you online and get your your products the next day um, or after that. So after working for a card issuer, which was City, and then working for the card network, which was the payment rail, now I got to work with merchants as a essentially a payment processor that was helping them process payments and, and get paid for whatever people were buying on their site. So it's really, I had this very um, unique or I'd say fortunate opportunity to work across the ecosystem to get another perspective. And so while I was at PayPal, I was leveraging my financial services industry experience because actually what I was working on was um, consumer lending solutions. So that's simply said like buying something today and paying later. So you may hear this term buy now, pay later, which is giving people the ability to buy something and pay over time. And so uh, I was working with merchants, some very large merchants um, online and helping uh, give consumers a choice as to how they wanted to pay with a PayPal product that would allow people to buy today, um, but pay over time. So really great experience. Um, and again, got to learn more about the ecosystem and also leverage my relationship management skills, managing those partnerships, and also leverage my financial services, FinTech industry experience. Was it different, the fact that now you're working kind of like with the merchants directly for you or at the essence of it, are all people just people? And if you hit the right skills on understanding people, you can work with anyone in any space. Um, I think that, again, I think it comes down to understanding what motivates people. And so the motivations of somebody who works at a bank um, trying to grow credit card portfolios or somebody who's trying to expand volume on a card network, uh, on a processing uh, card rail, or somebody who's trying to sell goods and services, like they all have different motivations. Um, so in the case of when I was working with merchants, they wanted to improve their conversion at checkout. They wanted to um, you know, grow their average order value, their average ticket size, 
and so, and they wanted to make sure that fraud was not high and people weren't, you know, had a good customer experience. And so I think it's always important for you to ask lots of questions um, and understand really what is important to them so that you can bring value, you can tailor what you're selling um, and your services, especially in business to business settings. Um, you shouldn't just sell, you should listen, ask questions, listen to those answers, and then provide um, your solution. Okay. And I think I, I, I think doctors do that all the time, right? The first question <laughs> they, they say is like, what's going on? You know, lawyers ask lots of questions. Um, I, teachers, teachers love to ask questions. Um, questions are critical in anything you do um, because you learn a lot, just like tonight, hopefully you're learning a few things. <laughs> a lot and very amazing information so far and i'm glad to know that my recent gig as a dj asking questions will not go to waste and it's a good skill to have like so all right i'm on the right track a little bit more comforting after a few slaps from the earlier lessons that you shared and um, even after paypal i think you moved to um actually doing a couple of other things you were in a fintech startup so how is and you were vice president of strategic partnerships at I think financial market or fin markets something like that. And yep. how was it like being different or how different was it in the startup space of this whole industry? Like so far, we've been speaking about entities that were quite established. There's pay, there's banks, there's PayPal, which is essentially like a modern day bank, and then now you're in something that's a lot more nimble. How tell us a little bit about the environment, the story behind that. Yeah, so I, I, first of all, I don't think you're ever too late in your career to work at a startup. Um, again, I think it's important to try lots of different things out and figure out the right environment, the right types of job responsibilities, industry, location, whatever personalities, it's always great to be able to try different things. Um, and I had this uh, opportunity to join a startup early stage um, and help grow um, a company from point A to point B. And that was also something that was fairly consistent throughout my career, even like I worked at big companies, medium sized companies, small companies, always wanted to be involved in growing a business or some sort of product or service at that business or with other companies to help them grow their business. So um, I was leveraging a lot of my partnerships, relationship management skills, I was, this was a lending uh, platform. So think of when you're checking out and you want to be able to buy now and pay over time, you may want different options. So you would fill out one application and get an immediate response and see which types of offers you qualified for. And then you could select one and, and, and go from there. Um, different industries. Um, I was working with everything from uh, healthcare to uh, reno renovating your home. Um, th those are not those are not inexpensive uh, jobs uh, when you want to redo your kitchen. So if you can finance that over time, even better. So um, just get it getting back to the company and and the experience is like when you work at a small company, there's not as many people around. So that's good in the sense that you can drive to decisions quicker because there's not as many people to weigh in on those decisions. On the other hand, 
and also good because you could do lots of different things. You can be a jack of all trades. You can, you know, as, as an entrepreneur yourself, you understand, you know, the value of being able to get stuff done quicker and, and be more nimble. The other side of it is though, not having a lot of resources um, can, can be challenging because there just aren't that many people around and, and some things are complex and you need people around and divide and conquer. So it can be, it can be good, but also challenging at the same time. All right. And in that whole, like having less resources to work with, how did your superpower come into play here to kind of like overcome that little challenge or that huge challenge in a sense? Yeah. I, I, well, I think what's, what's, what's most important, right. When you don't have a lot of resources is to be, um, very prescriptive, very thoughtful about how you spend your time. Uh, you have to be, you know, if you're taking three, four or five classes at school, and then you also are working and hosting a show on WQHS and <laughs> running, you know, uh, uh, you know, ascendance, like you're like, you only can be in one place at one time. So you have to really be ruthless with your time and be prior and you have to prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. So I think it, it, it's an, it's a, it's a very good, uh, trait or, or sort of behavior to uh, characteristic to learn is let's go after the biggest opportunities that are going to be highest impact, ideally lowest effort. So if you can find things that are low impact, high effort, that's the box that you want to play in. The box that you don't want to play in is low impact, high effort. Stay so away from that stuff. Something with little minimum effort, but you get the most results in a sense. Exactly. So a light lift, but it really, um, you, you get an amazing return relative to the effort that you put in. Um, or maybe there's a lot of effort up front, but then it has a long, long, uh, sort of, uh, lots of stuff come down the road and it just continues to churn, uh, opportunities out the door. But, um, you know, there's lots of life lessons that you learn working at a small company. Um, and also professional lessons. Okay. And I think that that was a personal reminder to go and rethink my schedule, which I will do after this amazing advice. <laughs> I will, I promise I'll be more ruthless with my time. I've been struggling with that lately. So it is a very like on time advice for me. The rest of you can just like, I don't know, pass over to this part. That part was just for me. And uh, <laughs> do, right do now, as I do, as I say, not as I do that. That's another uh, <laughs> idiom. I'm much better at giving advice than uh, than drinking my own Kool Aid. So, all right. Well, in that case, we'll have to send you the recording, and you can listen to your own advice whenever you yes. need any help. That's what I do with these episodes. I'm just like, hmm, I said that, didn't I? All right, I better do that. But okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> right now, you, um, I think you are at Stripe, and you are um, part of their global customer success management team, and you deal with, I would say, some of the biggest clients over there. How have you, how do you even manage like working with some of these companies, which probably are running in the billions with their revenue? First of all, like, I know you've built up your career to that, but isn't that a bit like, like, do you ever get nervous that like you're giving the wrong advice or you're having the wrong conversation with your clients? Um, it, 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 it can, it can still be, it can still be nerve wracking, right? When you're working with, um, executives at a company and they are relying on you and your company to deliver every day, every minute, every second, um, the, the infrastructure to process their revenue for them. So 
somebody is buying, you know, a camera at checkout on their store or somebody's ordering a car or somebody's, you know, buying food, um, they're relying on you and your, your company to deliver the, 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 the highest level of reliability. And so sometimes conversations don't go smoothly because there's certain things that have happened and it's important to a empathize with those individuals because they're having a bad day because of your company may not be delivering what they need um, or expect. Um, it's very, and I'd say not only is empathy critical in everything you do in, in life, whether it's professional or personal, um, again, you need to own up to issues. Um, if there are issues, you need to ask lots of questions and then try to problem solve. Um, because at the end of the day, especially in business to business, you know, the better they do, the better your business partners do, the better you do, right? It's very symbiotic. That's what I really love about a lot of the jobs that I've had in my career, especially when I shifted over more into the business to business side of the business is generally speaking, like if you're, if the partners that you work with are doing better, you're doing better. And so you align your goals to, to, to sort of match up. And so like that, that's just a natural extension of sort of relationship management is, you know, focusing on what's important to them and trying to deliver so things that are going to matter to them and help them grow their business. Okay. And again, you work with some of these companies, um, which again are in the billions and, um, I am starting out in the startup space and also use Stripe and recommend it to all my clients. So definitely a company that Thank I, you. no, yeah, you're welcome. Like all 50,000 students for our conference, we're going to tell them we're going to get it through Stripe. Don't worry. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and one of the things that I feel like, like for me, like um i think when i started my startup one of the things that i didn't notice is things that um happen like every detail matters like when i deal with my clients when i get payments from my clients and things like that even a letter wrong on their invoice or if they can't access that link because their wi-fi is down that suddenly becomes something that your company has to think about or like that i think about as the person providing the service and as someone who works with a lot of these merchants who are in my position i'd say and i probably in the position of many of the Stripe uh, users who are tuning in because they too love Stripe and want to hear you this. What do you think is the biggest thing that merchants or people who use your service often overlook or that they just don't think about? I, I, I think that what's interesting about payments and, and digital payments in particular is the whole goal is to help um, abstract away a lot of the complexity. People don't actually realize how complex and the financial payment system is and how old it is. And if you, if I, if I, we had another session, we could talk all about ISO 8583 messages and all, all this stuff that's going on in the background, but there's a, there's a lot. And, and a lot of things can break in that sort of passing of the payment uh, uh, from one entity to another who then passes it to the other and then it comes back and then you, you know, it all happens in milliseconds. So what, what's most important to you is that you're either paying somebody and it's, it, it works and, 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 and you receive payment or you or you provide payment and that it's there's no errors and and 
um, it's, I think people don't have a full appreciation for how much, um, again, complexity there is. And, uh, you know, companies like Stripe are really trying to help modernize a system that, again, has been decades, centuries in the making and just continuing to try to improve reliability um, and improve the, you know, the experience for everybody who's involved in the transaction on both, you know, not only on both sides, on all sides. So, yep. so it's, there's no magic formula, right? It's not that like clicking the button is not equivalent casting a spell that sends my money to someone. There's actually a process involved apparently, which I've now learned. So I will it, appreciate this yeah. more every time I transfer money to my sister for dinner, which I will do after this sister. But like literally, I think that that is very insightful. And with all of these complexities with this, I would say, again, this whole industry of the finance world, it, it dates back to, I think, the earliest, one of the earliest markers of civilization. I think you mentioned that before during our chat, where it, like it's about paying for something. It's about getting the goods. It's about that exchange of trade. And um, with this very old industry and with the this boom that we've seen in um, entrepreneurship, especially in the tech space, do you think there's still room for innovation? And for everyone who is looking to join in the fintech world, who has an idea which they feel can make a change, do you think um, it's the right time? Or do you think that we've missed it all and that we should wait for the next <laughs> dot com or the next revolution of the internet in a sense? Uh, I would encourage everybody to pursue um, opportunities for innovation. Um, when, when they, when somebody sees that, um, there's friction and there's, um, it's not working for them or they see like, this is not perfectly done. Um, maybe there's a better way to do it, a quicker way to do it, a cheaper way to do it. Um, I, I would encourage everybody. I mean, there's, there's companies that are being started every day, um, with slightly different approaches and, and different focuses or foci, foci, I don't know what the word is, but, um, there's, there's so many different nuances around getting paid and paying for things with respect to again, small businesses, large businesses, cross-border businesses, different industries, in-person, online, um, mobile. There's just like commerce literally is happening every second in every country. And so if you can help commerce happen in a more um simple frictionless manner um i would just encourage everybody to to uh to pursue that so can't wait to see what everyone does okay so that's our challenge for the audience guys you got to make sure that you come up with the next big thing or at least the next little thing that creates big change remember you were saying low effort high impact so go come up with some ideas guys and hopefully if you do well enough and make millions and you stripe um todd will work with you personally so until then that's the goal guys <laughs> <laughs> before we end our interview today any advice for all of us who are still trying to find our superpower what's your parting words um be patient um don't get ahead of your skis. Um, if there's any skiers out there, hopefully that means something to you. If you're not a skier, essentially just take things in a, in a pensive sort of thoughtful approach. You've got a long career ahead of you. Um, you've got time to sort of figure out like what you get excited about and um, you can always course correct. And you may not have one superpower, you may have more than one superpower. 
um, continue to be inquisitive, continue to be creative and, and be your, be your best, um, fan. Um, and don't beat yourself up again. Um, there's always opportunities to get better and improve and hopefully do more as I say than as I do. Cause I, or I'll have to listen back, uh, for the recording over and over, but, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty fascinating time to be in the world right now, especially as fortunately things are starting to get a little bit better in the world. Um, you know, it's been a pretty crazy, uh, you know, year plus, and hopefully people are starting to um, be able to move around a little bit more and uh, we'll see where things go. Okay. I think with that, you've ended our session really well. I'm now, I don't even think that I need to say anything, but thank you so much for being on the show. I think it's been very insightful and um, yeah, thank you for your expertise and your time. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Harsha. And, uh, you know, I've been getting to know you quickly, checking out some of your TED Talks and other things. And it's kind of amazing what you're doing at your age, because I was not doing anything like you were doing now. At, when I was your age, I was just trying to figure out, you know, how to get on a subway, um, not doing what you're doing. So kudos to you. And uh, hopefully... Everyone has a great rest of the year. Well, thank you so much. You are too kind. And to our lovely audience, I hope you enjoyed today's session as much as I did. Thank you all so much for watching. And do tune in again um, next Thursday at 10 p.m. EST here on WQHS Radio's Changing Reality. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. You're listening to Changing Reality. Changing Reality, where we bend reality all across the world. Only on WQHS Radio.